Um, I did put up um, an image of the book I was talking about. This is a book by David Snowden uh, on um, the Nun study. And it really is a very interesting, very readable book on some of the findings from his, um, from his longitudinal study. He's, he's done this study for many years. And I'll give you the name of the author. It's David Snowden. He's now in Kentucky, uh, but used to be in Minnesota. So it's Aging with Grace by David Snowden, S-N-O-W-D-O-N. Just in case you're interested, I think you will find it very interesting. I think it's a lovely um, book and um, uh, beautifully written and, uh, you know, very engaging, very informative. Not very expensive either, is it? No, it's not. It's not. It, this is, yes. It's, it's in paperback. So it's definitely not expensive. How long ago was that written? About four years ago, I think. I want to say it's, but the study is much longer. And then he consolidated his findings. I, I want to say it is sometime, yeah. I don't know if they have the copyright here. They do. 2001. This, this, the paperback edition is 2002. But the study has been an ongoing study for several years. I think you'll enjoy it. So if you do read it and have thoughts, do send me an email. And I'll share them with my aging class. <laughs> OK. What is your email um, It is, um, maybe I should put it on a slide for you. It's, let me write it here. It's Bookwall J. So it's B-O-O-K, book as in a book. It's wonderful to have a last name that's Bookwala, you know, and to be teaching. Because Wala in India is someone who deals with. So really, it's someone who deals with books. And, uh, and it really is book as in, as in the English word, book. At Lafayette. Yes, it's a J here. Dot edu. Dot edu, yes. So we're, um, today, we're going to sort of uh, switch gears in that we're, really, we're still going to talk about middle adulthood and late adulthood, but we're really going to look, we're going to concentrate on the role our relationships play in our health. And if you remember from the Rowan Kahn um, model of successful aging, our interpersonal relationships are very important to successful aging, right? They said that we have to be socially engaged. We have to be connected with people. That's an important element of aging successfully. And um, you know, initially, when, when the field of gerontology really came into being, we, there was a much stronger focus on cognitive aspects of aging. Because we all, you know, even if you're in your 40s and you forget something, you say, oh, I must be getting old, right? Because it's such a, such a key component of mm -hmm of getting older is to, th that your memory doesn't work quite as well as it used to. That's totally normal. There's nothing unusual about occasionally forgetting things. But there was a big focus on cognitive aging. And I'd say in the last 10 or 15 years, I think uh, social psychologists and psychologists in general who work in the field of gerontology came to recognize that <coughs> our social relationships can play a key role in how we age. There's some new research that even suggests that it can even help our cognitive function if we are socially engaged. People who are more isolated tend not to have memories that work as well. So being socially engaged helps us in multiple ways. And so we're going to focus in this lecture on the role of our relationships, and more specifically on marriage. Because some of my own research is on marriage and health as we get older. And so I'm going to uh, you know, stick in a couple of studies I've done here at Lafayette and share with you some of the things I've found while also describing the, the general field of relationships and health. Um, <clears throat> there is a very well-known, well-established theory on social support. This was a theory that was developed by Sheldon Cohn, who is at <coughs> Carnegie Mellon University. And he has a rich career of showing us how social support is critical 
to help. Um, some of the very early research, even before Sheldon Cohen uh, uh, came on the scene, was done in California, where they found that men who were middle managers, this was only on men at the time, back in the 50s and 60s, men who were middle managers and um, were, uh, had stressful lives but had supportive lives tended to live longer. And then they actually expanded that to men and women, and they found the same relationship. They followed men and women over 10 years and found that people who had better social networks, larger groups of friends and family members, 10 years later were more, li more likely to be alive. So, so clearly, social support seems to play a role in our health. And we'll talk a little bit uh, more about this. And then finally, we'll also touch on some lifespan theories of social engagement. So, you know, we've all heard that, oh, when we get, lo when we get older, we don't engage as much socially. Is that really true? While at the same time, we're being told, look, social engagement is important for health. So if we're, is it natural for us to not engage as much with people, or is it natural to engage more with people? We'll talk a little bit about that as well. There are some theories of social engagement. So do, you know, do, does our social engagement increase, decrease, or stay the same as we get older? We'll talk a little bit about that too. And then we'll actually move into the area of marriage and marital quality per se. So let's talk about social support and health. I'm going to give you a very, very broad overview of the, this entire area of, uh, of research. There's a distinction between social network and social support. Social network, if you, you can think of it more as it's a numbers issue. How many people, how many friends and family do you engage with on a regular basis? Do you talk to on the phone? Do you meet with? How often do you interact with these individuals? This is, it's sort of more an objective measure, if you will. Social support is your sense that there are people available to you. There are people you can count on. There are people who are there to give you support when you need it, whether it is support in terms of tangible things, like perhaps uh, you need a ride somewhere and you can get one. You need a loan of money and someone can give that to you. Or it could be emotional support or um, guidance, cognitive advice, or cognitive support where you provide guidance or um, advice to someone, or you receive it from someone. And within social support, there is a distinction between what you perceive and what really is there. And interestingly enough, what you perceive is more important than what is really out there. So if, for example, you think that you have a, a core set of people who really care about you and who are there for you, you're in good shape. Whether they're really there or not is a different <laughs> issue <laughs> when you need them. But the point is perception is very important. So if you perceive that there is support available to you, you actually have better well-being. So you go to sleep better. You, you, you go to sleep better, too. So, so in a sense, it's, it, what I'm trying to show you is that it's not really what is actually available or, or, or objectively there. It's really part of how we view what is around us, and what, what kinds of relationships we have with people. And I just want to point out that social support theory is not really the same as caregiving, where you're actually providing care hands-on or receiving care hands-on, where you're, you're, you're frail or infirm or ill or may have dementia, and, and someone is providing care. That's a very specific form of support, and it's a very tangible form of support. The social support that I'm talking about here in terms of the theory is just how all of us feel, even in the absence of illness. Just do we feel a sense of belonging? Do we feel like we have relationships with people that we, who care for us and who would pretty much you know, drop everything and come to us if we needed them? What Sheldon Cohen showed us, and he's done this beautifully in a lot of research, is that People who have higher levels of social support, and this is typically you're talking about perceived social support, tend to have better health and well-being across the board. So there's a direct relationship between social support and well-being. But he also showed that social support can act as a buffer in the face of stress. It can act as a cushion. It can, it can actually blunt the, the sort of the blow 
if you will, of stress. So let's say you're faced with a crisis or you're faced with a stressor. People who are in such a situation, if they have high levels of perceived social support, they tend to do better than people who have lower levels of social support. So in that sense, he went on to, to, to provide us with data that shows that there's a buffering role that social support plays in health. It not only contributes to us feeling great and having great health, but it also takes the edge off of nasty stuff that happens to us. So it's, a, it's an important resource that, uh, that, that we can have and that hopefully we all have. But I do want to point out that there is some data that shows that sometimes you know, having people around you cannot uh, be good for you, right? So can it actually be a stressor in and of itself? And there is definitely data coming out that shows that sometimes um, having people around you can actually hurt. Um, there are uh, specific studies that show, for example, that if there's a mismatch in what you need and what's being provided, so your child wants $1,000 and you're busy giving them love and affection, it ain't going to work, <laughs> right? Because when you need the money, you're hoping to get the money. So there needs to be a match between the need for support and what is provided or received. So there's some data to show that. There's another uh, data set and a lot of work done by Shelley Taylor, who's at UCLA, who has shown that for social support uh, to really be beneficial, very often you want to be with people. You want that support from people who truly understand what you're going through. And she's done a lot of work with cancer survivors and found that cancer survivors, when people offer support to cancer survivors, and these are individuals who have no experience with cancer, it actually does not help them. They, are, um, they may resent uh, some of that. They may feel that the individual doesn't understand anything. But when you put people with cancer who are so, who've survived cancer or are currently going through treatment for cancer, you put them with other cancer patients and form, you know, to see if they can feel more supported by that group, they do much better. They actually find that, you know, they, 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 it benefits them more. And it, it has to do with a shared experience, right? It's sort of the idea that if you know what I'm going through, then, I, then yes, your, your efforts at supporting me are going to be more meaningful than someone who, who tells me it'll be OK, but has never really gone through the experience. So she's done some really good work um, in that area. Uh, there is also a little bit of uh, research coming out now talking about how you know it's great to be giving support, but receiving support is not always so good. And part of the reason is that you need it, right? You may be in some uh, state of disability or need. You need support. And sometimes you can see that receiving support can have a negative impact because it may make people feel dependent. It may take away a sense of autonomy from, uh, from the individual. So there's a little bit of uh, data showing, especially in the area of caregiving, where clearly the person is dependent, may be disabled. There is some, uh, there's some evidence that, they're, they're, that these individuals who receive such care have a negative. Um, reaction to being helped and because they feel perhaps more like, you know, that they are a burden or that they may, um, that they are dependent. So this is really a very, very broad overview on this area of uh, research. And what I want to do is now talk about some theories of social engagement. Early on, um, there was uh, a theory that was sort of, you know, bandied about quite a bit on, known as a disengagement theory. And according to this theory, it is normal and completely healthy, if you will, for older adults to become reclusive. This is a very old theory, mercifully been debunked. You know, we don't buy this anymore. But the, this theory held that it, you know, as we get older, we want to become reclusive. We want to sort of get into a shell and not have anything to do with other people. They, they suggested it was normative. It was normal. All of us will go through it. The good news is, is baloney. <laughs> it's not true. OK, you ask older uh, adults, and they want to meet other people. They want to be with other people. You also have the activity theory. It's sort of, it was a direct um, you know, attack at the disengagement theory, if you will, that claimed that increased social engagement 
is healthy. It's good for us, and that is absolutely true, but the reality is that we do see a decrease in social engagement. And then in other studies, we see that there is an increase in social engagement. So how do we reconcile the two? Some studies tell us that, oh, you know, as we get older, we engage more with people. And that makes us feel great. Others say, oh, no, 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 there's a decline in social engagement. And there's evidence to support both sides of the coin. And so along came Laura Costinson. And she, she has a mouthful of a name for her theory. It's the socio-emotional selectivity theory. She's at Berkeley, and um, no, I'm sorry, she's at Stanford. And um, what Laura Costinson did was she, it's an ingenious uh, theory, it's a very simple theory, but she has data to support it. And what she said was there is actually, there are both processes going on. There's a decrease in social engagement and an increase, but it's a selective decrease and a selective increase. And what she said was that social engagement, as we get older, we don't want to bother with people who make us feel lousy. If you, you know, bring out all these negative emotions in me, I don't want to have to deal with that, right? So we actually do indeed diminish engagement with those who make us feel miserable, okay? But we do increase our engagement with those who make us feel good. And she said at the heart of this is our need for emotional regulation. That as we get older, when we are younger, there are two social goals. When we are younger, knowledge is a very important goal. We wanna, we wanna get more knowledge. We wanna amass more knowledge. And that's what we're doing. But as we enter middle age and late adulthood, our emotional goals become very important. And regulating those emotions, in other words, feeling good rather than lousy, becomes <coughs> so important to us that we pay more attention to it. Amassing knowledge, we've done that. We've been there, done that, so to speak. And so emotional goals become much more important. And we don't want to bother with people who make us feel lousy. And instead, we want to engage much more with people who make us feel good. For the most part, it's our close family members and close friends who make us feel good. And so you see an increase in those relationships in terms of interaction, and a decrease in terms of sort of the fluff, in terms of people that you're not so close to, who don't bring, bring about those positive emotions in you. Is that probably because as you get older, you have more choices? Maybe you're not working anymore, you don't have to deal with the crazy people you've been working with. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, absolutely. It, it, because there are changes that we go through, and, and hers is a lifespan theory, where she <coughs> says that as we get older, <coughs> What's available to us changes. Actually, there is a very, I, I was going to cover it and I knocked it out because I feared we would run out of time. There's a very well-established theory that was developed at the University of Michigan by Tony Antonucci, who talks about a social convoy. And she says that you can think of yourself at the very heart of a, of a whole series of concentric circles. And the very tiniest circle, that's you, right in the middle. And then we have these concentric circles around us. That's our convoy of people. There are some who are very close to us and they're in the circle right next to us. And then you know you fill up other people who are less close to you in the outer circles. And what she says is that we need this convoy to feel good. But the convoy changes as we get older. And the, the, the composition of our convoy changes. But we have that convoy and we should if we're going to have good health. Any other uh, questions? Yes. But through all this, and it, it's still stress is so central, right? Yes, stress I mean, is. It or absolutely, it? absolutely. Stress is at the heart of all of this, and, and you'll see that um, you know some of the the research shows you that too. And it could be normative stressors. You know, as we get older, we're more likely to have um, impairment in our day-to-day -day function. This is normative. It's not, it's not, it doesn't have to be traumatic. Even normative stressors can actually pose a challenge. And our relationships can go a long way in, in helping I mean, us. The, the thinking is, let's say you have stress. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, my whole idea of how I conduct myself is I don't take everything that seriously. Mm -hmm. 
and, and it's, it's like my consciously <coughs> kind of do that. Mm -hmm. I get angry when I look at a politician on TV, and I vent it, <laughs> and people are looking at me like, not I not it, I vent it, it, and then it's forgotten. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I, and I, you know, it's like that crazy guy, I don't give a damn. I mean, he's, he's there, I can't do anything about it, and that relieves my stress by letting it out. <coughs> people are saying, well, you shouldn't do that. Yeah, yeah, and we, you know, we didn't get a chance to talk about those two other models yesterday. And one of them had to do with coping, where uh, Carolyn Aldwin really came up with this model saying, most of the time, most stress-related models say that, you know, when you're under stress, you want to come back to homeostatic level, right? So if you think about the body, physiologically, if your heart is racing, you want to come back to homeostatic level. You want to have a normal heartbeat. If your, you know, blood pressure rises, you want it to come back to normal. So it's all about coming back to normal or returning to homeostasis when you're faced with stress. And what Aldwin said was, actually, as we get older, we don't want to come back to stress, we sh uh, to, uh, to homeostasis, rather. We, don't, we actually, and she, has to, she talks about coping resources, that over the lifespan, we are building our repertoire of coping. And if it means yelling at the TV, and if it works, by all means, do it. And that's what she says. Each of us builds a repertoire of coping resources that work for us so that the next time we face it, we're not at back at homeostatic level. We're not starting from zero in coping, but that we're building on our resources and we, we, we can access those that really work. So it's a very interesting model about how sometimes return to homeostasis is not what you want, especially in terms of coping resources. Yeah. I'm curious, you might talk about this, but this whole idea of concentric circles, um, uh -huh. and I suppose I'm fairly young in comparison, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of research being done with all these like Facebook and social networking sites because myself, I don't have any of those things because yeah. they stress me out. I yes. think I'm at that, <laughs> that area where I don't want to talk to you anymore because yeah. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And, 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 sort of is the direct opposite of what we like should be doing. Yeah, you know, I think the, the whole idea of social media is so new that we don't have any published research on it. But I can bet you that there are psychologists hard at work <laughs> looking at this <laughs> issue. Um, there was a lot of work done on internet dating, for example, when that was a new phenomenon, you know. It works, though. It, it works, uh, not in all cases. <laughs> but again, it's individual differences. You know, there can be, you know, marvelous unions that come out of it, and then there are people willing to kill one another. So, you know, it goes in both, in both directions. <laughs> uh, but, um, but, but you're absolutely right. And, and some of this, the, the whole c social media scene, they do think is a generational thing. I mean, personally, you know, at 46, I couldn't be bothered, right? I, the idea that everyone would know what's going on in my life just seems a little odd. But there are folks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yet I have uh, my, my brother, who is, you know, a year and a half older, loves it. And he thinks I'm crazy to not want it. But that's selectivity, though, the way you talked about Absolutely. the theory. That's just a modified <laughs> version of that. Yes, exactly. You know, exactly. you can choose what you're going to put out there. Sometimes. Yeah, although he claims you can choose who is your friend. I'm like, oh. This is crazy. I'll choose, but in real time, I don't need to do it virtually. You know? <laughs> um, but, but it's an ongoing little battle that, that we have. Um, you want to tell us more, Jamila? <laughs> <laughs> um, hopefully, they'll edit it out. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the basic, the, you know, going back to the socio-emotional selectivity theory. Again, it's a mouthful, but it's a, it's I think a, just a beautiful theory. It's a very new theory. Um, it's been around for about 15 years, and it's just, it's compelling because it's so incredibly simple. And when my students learn about it, they're like, but of course, well, no one thought about it, right? And no one tested it. So she is really marvelous at having thought about a way to test it. And I'm going to show you what she did. <coughs> so the premise of uh, socio-emotional selectivity theory, so Karstensen's theory is that, look, as we get older, it's important for us to regulate our emotions. We want to feel good. Who wants to feel lousy, OK? So it's, it becomes a very important goal. And what she says is how we perceive time plays a big role. And, and that's where the whole age issue comes in. If you have unrestricted time, you'll actually pick your, you know, anyone to spend time with. But if you have limited time, you're going to want to spend time with people who really make you feel great. So if you had just an amorphous amount of time, an unlimited amount of time, take 
for example, you're very young. Chances are that if you had a whole slew of people to spend time with, some very close family members or a very close friend versus a celebrity or you know someone very famous, chances are you would pick one of the other two, not the closest friend, because hey, I have all this time, I, you know, I can catch up with family, right? But as you get older, it's almost normative to see time as more limited, right? You, you have less time, I mean, statistically speaking, that is true. And so when you perceive <laughs> the time to be more restricted, you're actually going to pick to spend more time with those who really matter and make you feel good. I mean, you could have really close family members who drive you up the wall. You probably don't want to spend time with them, right? But for the most part, if they're making you feel good, you're going to want to spend time with them. And because being older is about a natural restriction in our perception of time, we pick to spend time with those we really care about and who make us feel good. So they did a, a, an ingenious study, and they've done a whole slew of studies. I'm really going to give you sort of the, the description of their, more or less their most famous study. And they did this over the telephone in the Stanford area. They actually called two groups of people, young, young versus older adults. They, they also had a study with middle-aged adults. But I'm really going to give you just sort of the, no, not too much methodological detail. If you'd like to read about this, I can definitely give you a reference. And it's very interesting. And then they had two perceived time conditions. So they had an unrestricted condition and a restricted condition. <coughs> what they did was in the unrestricted condition, they said that you, know, you have a half hour to spend just with no pressing you know, <coughs> demands or anything on your time. Who would you want to spend your time with? And they gave them three options, a new acquaintance, with whom you seem to have a lot in common, a celebrity, a, sort of an author of a you know, very well-known book, and a close family member or a close friend. And they asked in the unrestricted condition, what they expected was that the young people would be more likely to pick the newer people, so the celebrity or the person um, uh, the new acquaintance with whom they seem to have a lot in common, so you know, a new person that they could get to know. But they expected all the people to still pick the close family member. And then they had another condition that they introduced to the same people. And they said, now think that your time is restricted. You have a half hour to, uh, of time, free time, to spend with anyone you choose, well, among these three. And you're leaving. You've taken up a job far away, and you're leaving home. Who would you pick? They expected the older adults to pick just like they did. Didn't matter whether they were moving or not. The younger adults moved in the direction of making similar choices as older adults when they were in the restricted time condition. And they did all kinds of modifications of this. For example, they did something very similar where they told older adults, you have 30 more years. To live, there's a new, uh, you know, new sort of option available where you can extend your life painlessly. You can live in the prime of your life for 30 more years. Who would you pick? And they actually saw the opposite pattern. Then older adults would likely say, Ah, you know what? In the in the unrestricted time condition, I'm going to pick this celebrity or this author of a new book that I really enjoyed, or someone new who I seem to have a lot in common with. Because you now had sort of an artificial extension of your time. So it's a very, very ingenious study. They also did this with AIDS patients who, um, uh, you know, who were fairly young but were struggling with AIDS. And they found that those individuals, even though they were young, were more likely to pick like the older adults because they had a natural restriction in their perception of time. So very, very interesting study. So I mentioned that there are three social partners and, and I told you what they found. So this is, this is really, in a way, it revolutionized how we understand social relationships and aging. That, wow, time and how we perceive time is important. And as we get older, our perception of time, of course, is more limited. But there are some relationships where you, know, you just can't get out of them, right? I mean, what, and, and marriage comes right in there. So you're married to somebody. They do drive you up the wall occasionally, or most of the time. But, <laughs> um, 
what do you do? I mean, you obviously can't just say, I'm not going to engage with you anymore, right? I, you know, you're, I'm not going to have anything to do with you. If you're in a long-term marriage and, you know, you're, you're going to keep that marriage going, how do you explain this? How does this whole idea of emotion regulation play a role? Because you want to feel good. So we actually, there's a student who graduated uh, several years ago from uh, Lafayette. She and I, J Jamie Jacobs is her name. We did uh, a study using data from across the nation. And we looked at the relationships among age, marital quality, and mental health. So we, we looked at how these are interrelated. Is age and marital quality interrelated with health? In other words, do young and older individuals, and we had young, middle aged and older individuals, but do, does, be, does the age of someone impact on the strength of the relationship between marital quality and mental health? And I'll, and I'll explain what we did, and hopefully you'll see where social, socio-emotional selectivity theory comes in. So this is what we wanted to do. Um, and uh, Jamie was a great help. Actually, we had presented this uh, at a conference in Chicago as well. What we wanted to see was, well, OK, we know that there's a relationship between marital quality and mental health. There's a lot of research that shows that people who are in good marriages uh, have better mental health. There's a ton of research that shows that. But does age change that relationship? Does age play a role in the strength of that relationship? So what we predicted was in, in, in a relationship like marriage where you can't just say, OK, I'm not going to have anything to do with it. You can do it for a little bit of time, like an afternoon, but you can't do it you know, for an extended period of time. So um, what we wanted to see was, would there be age differences in how important positive and negative aspects of marriage, positive and negative characteristics of marriage would be to mental health? So would, for example, would socio-emotional selectivity theory would say that older adults would focus much more on the, what do you think, the good or the bad of marriage? On the good of the marriage, right? Because you want to regulate your emotions, you want to feel good. So they will pay more attention to the good parts of their marriage in terms of their mental health. But if you're younger, you're more likely to pay attention to the conflict and stuff like that. That will play a bigger role in your mental health. And that's what we predicted. And mercifully, that's what we found. <laughs> um, what we, uh, what we did was we, we compared three different age groups. And, and this is telling you exactly what I said, that we looked to see if there were age differences in how marital quality was related to uh, symptoms of depression. And that's a very common measure of mental health. Yes? Did the uh, people married self-describe whether they had a good quality of marriage? Yes. So this is all self-reported data. It's not observational data. Uh, you know, we didn't bring them in and have them. Perception. Yes. And, and there are those who argue that that's the most important aspect of it. You know, it's, I mean, from the, someone's objective view maybe that you're in a great marriage, but if you don't think you are in it, and actually, uh, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't go very far. Uh, uh, there is a sort of a distinction between marital quality and just, it's not just marital satisfaction, because with marital satisfaction, there are expectations that come into play, right? So if I don't expect much of, out of my spouse, I could be pretty happy. Do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> so, so we have to be a little careful, which is why we prefer the term marital quality than marital satisfaction, because if you, know, if you, you could have you know, the spouse of spouses, and if you have higher expectations, it doesn't matter what the individual does, you're going to be less satisfied. So, so we're very careful not to only look at marital satisfaction because a big chunk of marital satisfaction is your expectation for, you know, or, your, or your expectancy for that, uh, for that marriage. Um, but yes, absolutely. These are all self-reported. Self-reported symptoms of depression as well. These are survey data you know, where they actually surveyed um, uh, adults aged 19 and older from all over the country. And so these are, in that sense, representative data. You know, it, it really represents the, the U.S. population. And, and that's exactly what I said here. Oh, I hate this. OK. So just uh, to clarify, we had three age groups. We had young adults, we had middle-aged adults, and we had older adults. And we had different indicators of marital quality. You know, we asked, uh, or rather the survey asked, how happy they were in general with their marriage. 
how much disagreement there was, for example, in household, in the performance of household tasks, in the spending of money. <coughs> you know, how much, how, how often did they disagree? Was the role allocation in the marriage sort of equitable? Was there fairness? Was, you know, was each one pulling his or her own weight? And then how did you resolve conflict? And, and there, are, there are existing scales that measure these variables. Were there other selection criteria about the length of marriage or what you normalize for the marriage? Yeah, what the, the problem with age-related research is that age and length of marriage are Correlated. seriously confounded with one another because the younger folks are going to be married for less time, typically. What we did do was we made sure that we used only um, people who were married once. So we didn't include people who had gone through a divorce or remarriage because that was going to perhaps change um, you know, perception of marriage, expectation of marriage, all of that. But, um, but th that's uh, always a little bit tricky. If you have just the same cohort, it's much easier to look at, um, at length of marriage. And then we looked at symptoms of depression, of course. Oh. And I, I, I hope this, uh, you know, I, I tried to sort of capture this in, in these uh, graphs. What we found was what we expected to find that, hey, you know, the more happiness you expressed in your marriage, the less depressed you were, of course. But what was most interesting was that there was an age difference there. This relationship was much stronger for older adults, that's OA there, than for younger adults. So when we looked at the strength of the relationship between marital happiness and depressive symptoms, that relationship was much stronger for older adults than for younger adults. In other words, for younger adults, how happy they were in their marriages was less relevant to their mental health. Uh, which is smack what she would have predicted, right? Laura Costinson would have said that. That look, if you're older, you, you know, I should point out that we, we found very little age difference in terms of, they, you know, older adults were saying that they disagreed as well. It's not like they said we never disagree and we're in glorious marriages. They were, you know, each of them was telling us, oh, yeah, you know what? Uh, we do disagree about who does all the work in the house and, you know, who's spending all the money, who's making those decisions, things like that. So it's not like we had a, a massive difference there. But it's interesting that for older adults, being happy in their marriage was much more important to their mental health than it was for younger adults. And then when we looked at young adults and middle-aged adults, we found some other differences there. Of course, the more disagreement there was in the marriage, the more depressive symptoms. But that's, that relationship was much stronger for younger adults, just what she would have predicted through her theory. Costinson would have said exactly that, that marital disagreement will be very important. The negative aspects of marriage will be much more important to the mental health of younger adults than people who were older than that age group. And we found that for middle-aged adults that that difference really stayed between young adults and middle-aged adults, not older adults, but only these two age groups. And, and similarly, if they really did not engage in calm discussions, which would suggest that they were, you know, they were fairly heated, it was much more relevant to their mental health for younger adults than it was to older adults. So even within relationships where we're not able to just sort of say the hell with you, right, where we're in marriages, we, we, you know, we're, these are ongoing relationships, it's, you can't explain social engagement and disengagement quite so easily. We do make negative parts less important as we get older. To, to, and why, she would, Carstensen would say, it's because we want to regulate our emotions. Isn't that comparison a little corrupted by the fact that the older adults who are still married mm -hmm. have learned to deal with the conflict? Right. Uh, Absolutely. Whereas the, the younger people may separate before at, uh, too long, and the, the older adults who can't deal with the conflict separate. Absolutely. Abs and, and this is, uh, again, the bane of cross-sectional research, right? When you're comparing three ages, especially for marriage, and you know, you find, oh, uh, for example, there is a U-shaped curve very often that people talk about in terms of marital satisfaction, mm -hmm. that young adults are satisfied. I mean, if you look at, at young adults, they're highly satisfied. Older adults tend to be highly satisfied, and the middle adults, middle-aged adults are the least satisfied. So it's a U-shaped function. And, but that's really misleading, because the older adults who are still married, chances are, 
were in good marriages to begin with, and the really nasty marriages ended. Right. And, and that is all, yeah, and that is, that is going to be the case. But given that these are individuals who still report disagreement in the marriage, who vary in terms of happiness, it's interesting that happiness is less important to younger adults. And so from the theoretical standpoint, this is meaningful because perhaps when we are young, we're so focused on the negative that we, that's why the marriages may end. And as we get older, chances are you're not going to end a long-term marriage, although the baby boomers are changing that a little bit. Um, there, is a, you know, there, there is an increase now in divorce in, uh, in the late 40s and 50s, and sometimes even early 60s. And, and, and that has to do, we believe, with the baby boomer generation saying, OK, you know, the kids are launched. I'm ready. Uh, you know, I have 35 more years. I'm not spending it with you, you know? <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> I made a bad choice 35 years ago. Yes, yes. much longer. Marriages. Single yes, yeah. yes. I, oh, uh, you know, something to do something like this in India, for example, where divorce is much, much less common. Right. Yeah, it's a dream of mine. Someday, yeah, someday. <laughs> but anyway, this uh, this is telling you exactly what I. You know, I I never did give you my handouts, so um, I do have these handouts, and this time I did I printed them on just plain white paper so that it's easier to read, and you don't need to take any of this down. I'm sorry I didn't hand these out earlier. Um, OK. So with, with, with that, what I'm going to do is really move into a specific kind of relationship. So we've talked about social relationships and, and uh, well-being in general. Now we're going to talk about a specific kind of relationship. It's really the kind of work that I do and I find very interesting. And so um, you know, I'm going to share some of my research and also other people's research um, in this. So marriage and health in middle and late adulthood, that's what we're going to talk about. And uh, the, the, fir you know, uh, the first thing we'll talk about is just being married. <coughs> is that good for you? you know, is that good for your health? Does, does it help you to live longer? There are some who say that you know, it's not that you live longer, it just seems that way yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you're married. <laughs> <laughs> married men are the happiest, and single women which really says something. <laughs> um, there, is, there are some gender differences, uh, it's true. But um, so uh, to, we'll just talk first about marital status. And you know, I, I think uh, Mark Twain said it uh, fairly well here, that both marriage and death ought to be welcome. The one promises happiness. <laughs> <laughs> Doubtless, the other assures it. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so Mark Twain really put it very well that uh, you know both marriage and death have something uh, you know that's attractive about them. Um, one delivers, perhaps, and the other not so much. I hope so. I made a whole bunch of them. Are they floating around? If there are any extras, if you would move. Do we have any extras? Maybe I can get Sherry's and then. More? One more? Okay, okay. So, in terms of um, in terms of uh, some evidence on marital status, now we're talking about just being married, okay, not the quality of um, marriage. There's a very, very vast amount of literature to show that those who are married have better psychological and physical health than those who are not. I mean, there, this is, it's, uh, you know, there are folks who sort of criticize that research. They say, well, you're not looking at, um, you know, you're not comparing with the right kinds of groups. But um, it's hard to deny. The data show us that indeed people who are married are in better health, both psychologically and physically. 
And there is some uh, very compelling research that also shows us that being married also protects us in terms of just sheer survival. So it's not just feeling good or being happy, but hard data, like how long you live. That being married is related to living longer. Um, like I said, sex. some people argue that uh, you know it just seems longer. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> can you uh, tell us what meta means in this? Absolutely, a meta analysis is uh, a, it's a study of studies. So essentially, you're compiling all data from multiple studies, and you're trying to arrive at a general conclusion based on lots of individual studies. So it's, it's a study of studies, if you will. And uh, thank you for that. And um, it, this, this meta-analysis actually was about older individuals. So these are elderly individuals that, you know, the data only on elderly individuals. And what they found was, indeed, people who are married uh, live longer, and that there's really no um, gender difference in terms of that benefit. In other words, both women and men seem to benefit from marriage in late life. They live longer if they're married. All other groups had a higher risk of mortality compared to the married group. So it doesn't matter uh, whether you're looking at widowed, uh, widowed individuals, divorced, separated, or never married. They all had a somewhat higher risk. It's interesting, though, that the never married group was not as different. And with the baby boomer generation, we're seeing a larger cohort of people who never marry and who are doing just fine. In fact, I have a study that we did that looked actually at people who were never married. And I'll talk a little bit about How that. How do you protect from mixing up cause and effect? Uh, you can't with these data, but there's no way to experiment on this. So it really, we're talking about relationships. And uh, you know, does one cause the other? For example, is there a protection effect or a selection effect? In, in other words, do healthy people select into marriage? Or does marriage actually protect people's health? That is an age-old debate. Uh, but th what is undeniable is that there's a relationship there. What about non-married versus people living together? Ah, we're going to talk about that, the cohabitants. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we also know is that marital disruptions, whether it's widowhood or divorce, when they, are, when they occur in late life, they are linked, not surprisingly, to poorer health and higher risk of mortality. Um, and when you, when you think about cohabitation, which is what you're talking about, these are individuals who live together, but not in marriage. It, it blows people's minds because they don't have that same protective effect. And it, it's, it's perplexing. I don't have an answer to that. So people ask me, so how can it be? You're living with somebody that's the same thing that's happening in marriage. Why is it that cohabitation does not protect us the way marriage does? We don't know. Maybe we'll uncover it. But the, the data tell us that if you live together, so you cohabit, but you're not married, you don't have that same protection. So it's, it's sort of an enigma. Yeah? Is it also because there might be, there's more risk that the relationship will end in cohabitation than in the uh, it, it very well could be. It could be that there is more risk um, or, or fear of, of the relationship ending. Perhaps there is also. Um, less security in terms of finances. Well, they, they won't but, take your finances this time. Right. <laughs> right. And also, there's also perhaps less family support of that. I hope that's not mine. I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. Yes, then. Is it also true that Folks who cohabit are happy until they get married, and then they get divorced. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't believe there's any data on that. But an uh, anecdotally, I think we all know people who have lived together for a long time, supposedly blissfully. I know, I know somebody who who went through that anecdotally, and then they got married, and within a year, they they called it quits. So. Uh, so there must be something that changes, and uh, you know, it, it, it would be great to do a study on that. It's just how do you find those people, right? How do you find the people who are living? I mean, you have to follow them over a long period of time. It seems to me that the young people today, before they marry, that's a natural thing. They just go, they go into one place, mm -hmm. and they live there. 
Yeah. So they one gives up their apartment, yeah. and uh, but it's a short lived. It's yes. Short -lived. Yeah. It, it's a trial period, oh, I think. Yeah. It puts a high, a high yeah. Yeah. In fact, Carolyn, you really point out a very important um, feature of this research, that it is generational, right? Cohort effects. Because how we define marriage changes. Chances <coughs> are, you know, people who got married in the 50s had a very different expectation of marriage um, than people who are getting married today. Is there any of this data uh, analyze same-sex marriage? Not, not uh, these data, but there are studies that, uh, that look at that. There is somebody by the name of Lawrence Kurdek, K-U-R-D-E-K, who does a lot of work on same-sex couples. Uh, not necessarily marriage, because that's a very new phenomenon, and his published research you know, dates back uh, to even you know, 10 or 15 years ago. But um, he does look at unions, uh, civil unions, and so uh, or at least talks about them a little bit. And uh, there, there is no reason to believe that those relationships are any different in terms of the quality. You know, it's not like if, uh, that somehow the quality of the, the union is more important in a heterosexual couple <coughs> than in a same-sex couple. A totally different culture. Yeah, but, but so the, the expectations are the same, and the importance right. of happiness is the same. But we don't have enough of a group mm -hmm. to, uh, to study. OK. So, so I wanted to, I'm going to share with you uh, some of my own research on marital status and well-being. And we took a very different approach. And so we, um, uh, we got into this study um, thinking about this group that is really more or less neglected in research. You know, if, you were, if you're never married, most of the time you're just lumped together with the widowed and the divorced people because you're, you're a small group, for one thing, and don't, people don't know what to do with you. You know, how do you make sense of people who don't marry? And I do want to point out that in our study, we did, you know, we had data about sexual orientation. So these are self-described heterosexual individuals. And what we did was, and this study actually was published last year, and we wanted to look at the role of, and I'll explain what I mean by psychological resources in mental health. Our sort of, our rationale for this was that there's a lot of data that shows that people who are never married have smaller social networks and typically report less social support. And it makes sense, right? Because you don't have, uh, you know, I mean, if you're married, you have a larger group of friends, perhaps, because most people marry. You have couples uh, that get together. And also, you have in laws. Uh, you know, never married people don't have to deal with in laws, which is probably a great ad for not getting married. <laughs> 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 but, uh, uh, the, the truth is that, that they have you know, smaller networks. We do have that in data, that they typically have fewer social resources. So what we wanted to ask was, given that they have fewer social resources, did they rely more on themselves to feel good, to, to protect their mental health? In other words, their own characteristics, their own attributes. Do they focus more on those? Do they give more importance to those than do married individuals? And that's what we set out to, um, to look at. So it's a largely an, a, you know, a neglected group. And what we wanted to do was we used married adults as a comparison group. Again, we took uh, data from a, natu a nationally representative sample. Lafayette College is a member of a consortium uh, of colleges and universities that has access to data that are collected from uh, you know, all over the country that are housed at the University of Michigan. And so we draw on data from, from this um, repository of data. And um, what we, what we uh, did here was we compared these two groups. We had a smaller group of never married adults, needless to say, than married adults. But just statistically speaking, we controlled for that. We actually weighted the sample um, of never married adults so that, we, so that the smaller sample did not hurt uh, the analysis. And we looked at three different issues or attributes related to one's psychological makeup. A sense of mastery. So do you think you're in the driver's seat in your own life? Do you feel like you're in control? Do you feel your life is headed in a direction that you want it to go in? That's what sense of mastery refers to. And there are scales that measure sense of mastery. Agency is the ability to focus on yourself rather than on, on other people. So can, are you able to focus on yourself and your needs and fulfill those needs rather than 
on other people. And self-sufficiency is, can you depend on yourself? Can you rely on yourself to get things done? And what we wanted to see was whether these would be more important to people who are never married <coughs> to maintain mental health than people who are married, who have social resources, which are also important to mental health, right? We've talked about that already. And as our mental health indicator, we looked at emotional well-being. And the more technical terms are positive affect and negative affect, but we're really talking about positive emotions and negative emotions. Positive emotions refer to being cheerful and happy most of the time. They're really related to mood. Negative um, affect has to do with feeling angry, hostile, bitter, resentful, those kinds of emotions. And in, in our analyses, we wanted to control for social support and those kinds of variables because we know there's a difference between the two groups on these. So we actually control for these. I should also point out that in all, our, in all my research, I also control for things like gender, uh, socioeconomic status, education, and things like that. You know, I, I didn't want to get into the sort of the statistical details here, but I'm happy to share those with you if you need. I have no idea why this is doing this, but okay. So what did we find? We actually found some of the most interesting findings for negative affect or negative emotions, and not for positive. So I'm going to focus on these negative emotions. But what is important to, to know is that we found no difference between um, married and non-married folks on personal mastery, agency, or self-sufficiency. So they were pretty much equal. Okay. We did find a small but significant difference between the two groups on emotional well-being. Married people did report slightly better well-being, and that's really been shown in the literature. And they also actually did indeed report higher social resources, which we know already. What we found was really interesting, that just as we had expected Psychological resources, so personal mastery, agency, self-sufficiency, were much more important for never married adults than they were for married adults. It just played a bigger role in mental health for never married adults than for married adults. And they also worked somewhat differently in the two groups. And I want to share those differences. So what did we really find? How did they work differently? The one for self-sufficiency was just uh, remarkable, I think. Um, let's talk about personal mastery here. You can see here that these are, and these are people who are divided. I'm not going to get into the statistical details, but we, we, d we looked at standard deviations around the mean, and we had a group of low mastery and high mastery. And then we had, of course, the married and the never married group. And what we found was really interesting. That needless to say, you can see the slope is negative for both groups. In other words, you know, you ha the more masterful you were, the higher mastery you reported, the less negative emotions you experienced. But what was really interesting was that the group that was lowest was the never married group who were highly masterful. So people who had high mastery and were never married had the lowest level of negative emotion. So it really seems to help them in terms of feeling good. When it came to self-sufficiency, we actually found opposite patterns. If you were high on self-sufficiency and never married, you had very low negative emotions. It was a negative slope. But if you were married and you were highly self-sufficient, you had more negative emotions. It was really painful. Actually, right? It actually hurts you. Why do you think that may be? That if you're more self-sufficient in marriage, conflict in the it perhaps could mean more conflict in the relationship. That maybe when you are in a marriage, you need to be able to do some give and take, to be able to compromise. And if you're so self-sufficient and you're so self-reliant, it may actually really erode uh, your me mental health or emotional well-being. So we thought this was really interesting. And actually, this got a lot of press attention. And then I started getting emails from single people <laughs> who were never married from all parts of the world telling me about how happy they were that this, uh, this research came out because it suggested that you could be never married and you could be fine. Uh, right? <laughs> and, uh, and more importantly, that you know these are resources that we could perhaps Trained 
people on. You can get people to be more masterful, to, you know, to, to exert more mastery or to exert more control over their lives. And you could perhaps raise people's levels of self-sufficiency. You could train people to feel differently about themselves and perhaps raise emotional well-being. So it, it was really exciting uh, to have this come out. And so I thought, well, who better uh, to say this than Mae West? Who says that marriage is a great institution? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not ready for an institution. Um, and, and, and you know, it, it works fine, clearly, if you have the, the right psychological resources. Um, so moving on, so we've talked about marital status. So being married clearly is important. How about the quality of the marriage? So if you're married, does it really matter what kind of marriage it, it is, or does it not matter? Well, it, it, you know, needless to say, it does matter. And, uh, you know, Socrates <laughs> said it, uh, interestingly, by all means marry. If you get a good wife, you will become happy, and if you get a bad wife. <laughs> <laughs> So we know more about Socrates than he probably wanted us to know. We, we can say something about his marriage. Um, <laughs> so, so clearly, uh, you know, a good marriage is, is important uh, to be happy. And there is a, a good amount of evidence to show that. And I'm just going to very quickly talk about some research that has come out from, um, I believe it's Texas A&M. Um, or maybe UT at Austin, uh, by Umberson et al. And she looked at marital strain. And what she found is that, needless to say, it is related. The more marital strain there is, the poorer health at any given time. And more importantly, over time, there's a decline in health. So people who have high marital strain over time show a, a clear decline in health. And she's looking at, at uh, middle-aged and older adults. And also, interestingly, they found that this relationship between marital strain and poor health strengthened over time. So there was a decline in health that is seen with marital strain that is greater at older ages. The older you are, the more likely it's going to have a negative impact on your health. That's essentially what they found. It's a very interesting uh, couple of studies that they've published on this. <coughs> Again, they found no gender differences. In other words, it's not that marital strain is worse for men than women. It's bad for everybody in terms of health. <coughs> and we did, I, I, I've done some research on this uh, here with, you know, with people who are middle-aged and older, and I'll very quickly talk about that. And I wanted to see um, the relationship between marital quality in middle and late adulthood and how it's related to physical health. And again, um, what I did was I, I used uh, data from a national sample that's a representative of the U.S. population and looked at positive and negative characteristics of marriage and then uh, looked at a range of physical health indicators. Um, the, the ages are, again, 19 to 74, and <coughs> we had middle-aged and older adults, 50-plus um, years uh, of age, and on average, the sample was 60.5 years. What, what, this is a different data set than I had been talking about earlier. And here we have five marital quality uh, dimensions. Marital disagreement, positive spouse behavior. So, you know, does the, does the, and this is asking people, does your spouse make you feel good? Do, they, do you feel cared for? Do you feel they listen to you? They, you know, they care about you, what you think? The, those kinds of behaviors. And negative spouse behaviors, does, does your spouse make too many demands of you, is very critical of you, those kinds of um, behaviors. And then also, um, you know, how much did you, did you communicate with one another in terms of decision making? Did you typically make decisions together? Or did, you know, one person make most of the decisions? And then, you know, overall, how would you rate your marriage? And what was really interesting, again, these are self-reported data, but we have physical health data here in, in different forms. Chronic health problems such as asthma, hypertension, there's a whole list of them, and you had to check off which ones uh, you had been diagnosed with. And then physical symptoms had to do with just sort of day-to-day um, -day experiences um, related to your health. So for example, fatigue, um, there's even things like profuse sweating, uh, headaches, backaches, just sort of day-to-day -day, you know, things that can really get you down in terms of health. 
Functional impairment has to do with just not being able to carry out your day-to-day -day function. So you're not able to, to walk, you're not able to do your housework, you're not able to perhaps prepare your own meals if you, if you did used to prepare meals. And then self-rated health is a classic. It's a one single item where you just ask people, how would you rate your health right now? And you give them five options. Excellent, very good, good, fair, and poor. And uh, even though I, I'm not going to talk about this much here, there is some marvelous research that shows that this one single item is so powerful, it can predict who's going to live a few years from now. What they found is after you have control for everything, what you know, doctors' diagnoses, medications being used, uh, of course, you know, socioeconomic status, all of that, if you can ask people about their self-rated health and put that into an equation, it can predict who will live five, seven, ten years from today. So it's interesting that this is doing this over and above a doctor's diagnosis or a doctor's reports on your condition because it suggests that each of us has a sense of something more. And people who rated themselves as very good or excellent were much more likely to be alive. And there's, this work has been done by Ellen Eidler, who is at Yale, and she's done some really interesting work um, on self-reported health and self-rated health in the single item. And here's what we found. There was one aspect only of marital quality that came out um, as important for physical health. It didn't matter which one we were talking about. If people said that my spouse engages in more negative behavior, so tends to criticize me a lot, makes too many demands of me, you know, doesn't really listen to me. Those behaviors were over and above every other thing in the model. That was the one that came out as significant. People who said that their spouse is engaged in that, and didn't matter whether you were male or female, they reported more chronic health problems. They reported more physical symptoms. They reported more disability, and they reported poorer. So pretty compelling. It suggests that there's a relationship. Do we know cause and effect? No, we don't. But we know there's a relationship there. And it's important for us to be aware that you know, if, if your spouse is giving you a hard time and so you have lower marital quality, it really takes a toll eventually. And it takes a toll even on physical health. So I remind my husband every night. <laughs> <laughs> I tell him to be so thankful that he's in great health, because he has a spouse who doesn't engage in negative behaviors. <laughs> um, and so, you know, who else, right? Um, she has said it well. <laughs> a man is incomplete until he's married, and then he's finished. <laughs> so, too many negative health be and negative spousal behaviors, it's going to hurt you. Well, it's, it's how you interpret finished. Yeah. <laughs> True. My hunch is she it's meant. It's a positive and negative. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep, yep. <laughs> and so I, <laughs> I want to circle back to what we talked about in terms of social support and how it can cushion us. Mm -hmm. In the, in, in the face of stress, right? So if you have lots of, you know, if you perceive that you have very good social support and you're dealing with, with something difficult, an adverse event, it's going to cushion the blow. It's going to, you know, it's going to blunt the effect of that stress. Well, does a good marriage do the same thing? So we know in general social relationships are important. Well, let's hone in um, and look at marriage. And I just want to point out that there is other research that has been done in this area. And again, uh, Castle, Stan Castle is at Yale, and they've done uh, some work on closed marital relationships um, <coughs> and how they can sort of take the edge off of age-related stresses. So these are normative things that perhaps most of us will go through. And what they did was they actually looked at different groups of older adults who were experiencing uh, one of two kinds of stressors. Uh, one had to do with living with a spouse who was cognitively impaired. And one had to do with living with a spouse who was depressed, clinically depressed. And what they found was that if the, the well spouse reported that the relationship was close with the spouse, that actually helped their well-being. They, they did not report as low well-being as people who were in the same situation who said that their 
relationship with the spouse was not very good. So an interesting idea that you know a good marriage can, can blunt the effects of a stressor. So we looked at, at some of uh, you know, the same kind of research. Now this is the last study that I'll talk about, where we looked at um, marital quality and how it's related to depressive symptoms. We've al we already know that. We also know that physical disability is related to depressive symptoms. Well, can mar a good marriage actually change this, uh, uh, change this arrow? Can it actually weaken this arrow, if you will? D can it weaken that relationship? So we looked at physical disability as that stressor. Most of us will go through some form of impairment. Again, it's a national probability-based sample. There are three dimensions of marital quality, uh, marital disagreement, how much time you spend together, free time, and then how happy you are in your marriage. And what we found was, as you'd expect, that the more marital disagreement there was, the more depressive symptoms, and the more physical disability there was, the more depressive symptoms. But what was really interesting was that if you look here, people who had high disability, this is this group here, and who had high disagreement, look at their depressive symptom levels. They were the highest. So if you had low disability, so you had low stress, um, you know, being in a good marriage was, of course, um, uh, good for you because if you had more disagreement, you had more depressive symptoms. If you had less disagreement, you had less. That made sense. But look at how this, you know, there's a divergence that occurs here where if you were highly disabled and had less disagreement in your marriage, you were much less depressed than this group. So it was it, it fairly compelling that if, you have, if you're faced with a stressor like disability and you have a good marriage, that can protect you in terms of your emotional well-being and your mental health. <laughs> and so this is my favorite quote of all time. But he says, my wife and I were happy for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we're, we're done. And I wanted to leave some time today for questions or um, any thoughts or experiences you'd like to share. Glenn? A question. Unmarried people with high self-sufficiency have lower negative emotions. That's right. But they have higher mortality. They, is it all linked to the social network and the family? Yes, and, and, and that's the important thing, thing to remember, that we're just taking out a piece and looking at, you know, sort of self-sufficiency. But we're not factoring in other aspects of their life. Absolutely. So does that mean that they are always going to be in great health? No. It could be, though, that those who are more likely to die have fewer resources in other, in, in other dimensions or domains. Yes. Was there a relationship... I don't know if, this, if you tested or, or analyzed for this, but a relationship between um, the master, or I forgot. Mastery? Mastery and the self-sufficiency. Yes. Typically, people who were higher on mastery had higher self-sufficiency. Was that uh, regarded as having a, an impact on the quality of marriage? In other words, people who are uh, highly, uh, high mastery and high self-sufficiency are more likely to report um, low, uh, marital conflict? Yeah, well, it, w it was difficult to do that because we had a group that was not married. Oh, well, you know, I so, thought the control so, group was the married. Yeah, right, but so we didn't test it within each group. But that would be a great thing to look at, to see if um, you know, higher self-sufficiency was related to lower marital it quality. It would suggest that it is. Yeah, those because, seem like qualities that get in the way of compromise. Yes, absolutely. And so within that group, you would expect to find that. And my hunch is that if we actually ran the analysis, we would find that relationship mm -hmm. because that's what the data show us, that if you were highly self-sufficient, um, you know, it, it could actually hurt uh, your emotional well-being. Any other thoughts or comments? Yes? No. No? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> OK. Yes? Five. Uh clergy person, uh, Peg Miller, mm -hmm. did so a lot, gave a lot of thought to this and reached some conclusions, but didn't publish anything on it. At the beginning, we said people, older people, who are in a giving situation, uh, have a more positive 
result or consequence from it, and people who are in a receiving situation sometimes don't. Uh, she said you can view receiving as a gift. If you're not willing to accept what's being given to you, then you're rejecting the gift. Yes. And, and so I don't know if people can be taught that. You know, I, I would hazard a guess that they can. And it's something that we need to do uh, because it does help. Uh, if you can see it as a gift, you're not going to have some of those negative reactions to being helped. Um, it, it also has to do with who is providing the help. So for example, if there's a role reversal, right? Uh, this is typically seen in spousal pairs, where if the man who had always seen himself, and you're talking about a cohort where men were raised to believe that they were the providers, their wife is now looking after them, that's a little bit difficult for them to deal with. Similarly, if their children are now looking after them, when they were always looking after their children, that role reversal can be difficult. So there's, it has some element of the, the stress that comes from a change in roles, from, from one of being independent and autonomous mm -hmm. and perhaps the provider to being one who is more dependent. Yes. You were talking about uh, going back to support groups helping people uh, who have had the same problems or having the same problems. I've known, yeah, people, yeah. I'm sorry. I've known people who have, uh, have had a disability like severe diabetes, and they don't want to be in that support group. They said, I don't want to hear about their problems. I've got my own. Yeah, then now that's interesting uh, because most of the time support groups are, are formed around an illness or a particular stressor. So for example, you know, people who, who have family members who have committed suicide will usually get together because they understand one another's experiences. So that's probably more the exception than the rule because most of the time if you wanted support related to your condition, you're going to prefer to be talking to people who, who truly understand what you've done. That's more yeah. <laughs> uh, was there any type of study that showed what it is that caused longer marriages? Um, so predicting, um, there is a research, but with young couples. Younger couples, uh, they have been looked at, you know, so sort of they're, they're usually tracked soon after they get married. So you look at newlywed couples, for example, and you track them over time, usually for seven to 10 years. There are studies that show that a lot of it has to do with conflict and disagreement. A little bit of uh, infidelity, those kinds of things um, also show up. But conflict is a big part of it, and how they resolve conflict or don't. Uh, you know, and communication patterns. There's a lot of research uh, that's been done by uh, someone by the name of Gottman, G-O-T-T-M-A-N. Uh, he doesn't do research uh, currently, but he's done a lot where he would bring couples in and he would tell them to think about an issue that they disagree about. And then he would step out and he would record them trying to talk about the issue. And he would find that communication patterns where they're not listening to one another, they're talking at one another, would predict which couples would, would end up in a divorce um, seven or 10 years later. So there is some research, but it hasn't been done with long-term families. Because if I started following people who are newlyweds now, you know, I, I won't be around. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's quite a challenge That's doing. That's negative. <laughs> <laughs> Unless I'm a successful ager, of course. Uh, Stephen, then we'll come over to the back. Um, you talked before about how self described health status is a very powerful indicator of longevity. Mm -hmm. And there again, there's that sort of cause and effect. Is mm -hmm. that you know something about yourself or, and this is where my question is, have there been studies of the sort of psychosomatic benefits of attitudes about your own health or attitudes about dealing with health problems? There, there are studies that show that people who view themselves as being healthy or engaged in a healthier lifestyle tend to, to report better health. Now, do they live longer? Just in terms of their attitude, we don't know because the data actually show that it depends on how much they do. So it's not really psychological. It's also do they actually exercise? Do they actually eat right? Not so much, a, you know, they're eating cake every afternoon and then they're claiming to be healthy. 
Yeah. That, that's not working for well, them. If you do eat cake, then you are healthy. Oh, then, then it's good. <laughs> <laughs> this may not be a fair question, but I'm curious to know whether the uh, undergraduates ha um, have as much appreciation for the subtleties of some of the, you know, the, the um, uh, factors that we're discussing here as, as the, the, we adults. Um, <laughs> I don't know what you, you know, not adults, but the, uh, is, do you see a difference? difference in terms of the, uh, you know, how we appreciate or understand what you're talking about compared to the undergraduates? Oh, absolutely. This is so refreshing. I wish you could be my class every <laughs> year. Uh, because, it's, it, it, what, because of what I teach, right? Because I'm talking about really a future state for them. And so it is definitely a challenge. What I'm happy to say is that when I first came here, there was a time when I had eight students in my aging class. And now I have 35 and 40. So, um, so it feels great. It feels wonderful that you know, in, in the last nine years, I've managed to at least get students to talk among themselves and say, look, this is interesting. And I do try very hard, at least the ones that I managed to nab, <laughs> you know. I try to get, to get them to see how relevant this is to their own lives. And what I found is that making it personal seems to really connect with the students. And what I mean by that is that in my aging class, for example, I have them do what I call a narrative portrait, where I have them take an older adult or a middle-aged adult from their lives and have a one-on-one -on -one long, hard chat with them, and they report on that chat. Mm -hmm. and parents, or parents or grandparents. And without a doubt, and all they have to do is they, they have to construct a portrait, but in words. They have to tell me about this individual and their lives. And honestly, to a head, they come back and say, I had no idea that this was my dad's life, or my granddad's life, or my grandma's life. And they, they, it just seems to, to be the most meaningful part of you know, at least the assignments in the course. I also send them off to Praxis, which is downtown, which is a facility for people with Alzheimer's and other dementias. And they have to spend some time there, um, not just observing, but actually engaging with the elders. Sometimes they're painting their nails. Uh, sometimes they're playing a balloon volleyball with them. And m giving them that personal contact really seems to help. Most of them will say, oh, when I first took this course, I was you know, really apprehensive. But they come out of it, I do hope, uh, with a much more positive view on aging. I mean, I see that if I've done that, then you know, I, I, I've served my purpose. So it, it's a course I love to teach. I really do love to teach Is it. Is there a career path for young uh, interested to study this area? Oh, boy. Oh, sure. it, you know, just from a purely <laughs> pragmatic <laughs> standpoint, if all, it's something I do try to, to uh, inform them about, that there are galore opportunities. Uh, related to older adults, whether it's in healthcare or finance or anything, um, there are a lot of um, a lot of opportunities. What we need to do first, though, is sort of get those negative stereotypes that we were talking about out, because they need to see um, aging as not something like oh, it's about some you know other yeah it's not yeah some other world, but that it's it it and it, that it's beautiful and that it's fun. I keep telling them when I turned forty, I loved it. You know, I just love turning 40. And they look at me sort of, really? But, but I, I do try to explain to them that, uh, you know, sort of the trials and tribulations that you go through in your 20s and 30s, for the most part, you, you master those by the time you get into your 40s and 50s. And so I get them to see that it's great being older. <coughs> try stopping. Yes. <laughs> One of the uh, behaviors is the, the marital conflict behavior. Uh-huh. younger people, okay? Because, I mean, here's an opportunity to change behaviors before they place themselves in that kind of a conflict situation. I mean, is, <coughs> does the light come on, or ha is, there a, is there a teaching tool that you can use yeah, to, to um, make that happen? I'll, I'll be honest. I'm not able to talk as much about my research during the course as I would like to. So, um, so this is really something that I talk to um, or, or talk about it with students who are interested in, in research. So who read up or they, you know, they've talked to me and then, and then I can tell them more about sort of this, the, the research with marriage and health. I, 
it's very hard because there's so much to cover in the aging course that I'm only able to sort of get at you know the very you know just a sort of superficial details. I mean, you have a situation here with, for example, like hypercritical. Uh huh. Hypercritical, uh, yes. Uh, Absolutely. Yes. And you know, it's going to take them 20 or 25 years to learn this lesson. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Here you have an opportunity. Absolutely. To sort of you know, I, if I'd, off in the right direction. You yeah. Know, put the arrow back on the right <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, uh, I'll share with you a sort of a, uh, you know, a, a goal of mine is to develop an upper level course. To have uh, students, so there's, you know, perhaps sophomores and juniors taking a course on relationships and health. Because it's really important, I think, for them to see it. And not just something about it as related to marriage, but also in their dating relationships. Because many of them are dating and are in highly conflictual relationships and so well, yeah who find themselves in these in, the, in these uh, negative relationships they, they it takes them years you know to figure this out and, and to and to see the light and su suggest that hey you know maybe I'm the problem exactly uh, <laughs> a part of it how, yeah how, how, to, how to get these things sure. back on track but I'm not sure how you you know that the, the people going into the relationship realize that they will be the problem and if they did they wouldn't probably enter the relationship. In other words, you know, the problem with hypercritical uh, spouse, you know, how do you predict that from, and if you did, why would you enter into it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, there are some, um, uh, some studies done mostly with college students about, um, you know, sort of relationship formation, relationship maintenance, who gets into relationships, what do they seek in relationships, do, how do those relationships, oh, what kinds of relationships last? I mean, you know, when you're talking to a college, uh, student population, you know, they think that a, a six-month relationship is a long relationship. <laughs> They're like, oh, we've been together for six months. I'm like, hey, really? <laughs> so uh, the perspective of time is very different <laughs> in, in this uh, group. But they also think they can change other person. Yes. A lot of times they can. Yes, and and you can get into, you can dig yourself into a hole with that. Absolutely, especially with. I mean, there's been some research on, on substance abuse and where, you know, people will get into relationships knowing that someone is abusing drugs or, you know, is uh, drinking too much, and they're convinced that they'll change that, and it's very difficult. Being battered, you know, uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes, and, it, you know, it's, 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 it's a seductive thought that I, I'm powerful enough to make a difference, right? So you want to, you, you know, you, who wants to d dispel that notion about themselves that they could actually make a change in someone's life, and they find themselves in in horrible situations. Yeah. Does the department teach uh, courses on personality types and yes. how they interact? Yes, Professor Basso in in uh, psychology teaches uh, a course on personality and personality theory. Yeah, and and a lot of what we're talking about has you know per, uh, personality underpinnings uh, there too. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I know that we're past time, but I just wanted to say thank you so much.